Mr. President, this is a, a story and a movie we see all too frequency, frequent in, uh, frequently in this chamber and in the United States Congress. Manufactured crisis after manufactured crisis after manufactured crisis. Here we are, a few short days away from actually seeing the charter of the Export-Import Bank expire. Think about that, a 70-year institution, a critical piece of trade infrastructure. We spent the better part of last work period talking about trade promotion authority. And for very many of us, this was a very difficult vote. It was a conflicting vote, and at the end of the day, the one argument that sells the day is 95% of all consumers in the world live outside the United States. And if we aren't participating in trade, if we aren't working to make sure that our exports are competitive, if we're not making a difference for American manufacturers, we're gonna lose the competition for the, the customer. We're gonna lose the opportunity to grow our manufacturing base. And so the Export-Import Bank, not a lot of people know what it is, but the people who do and the businesses that do know that this is a critical piece of trade infrastructure. You know, the irony, uh, perhaps, of this whole issue is there's no one, there's no group outside of conservative think tanks who doesn't agree that the Export-Import Bank needs to be reauthorized. We have the United States Chamber of Commerce begging us in the Banking Committee to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. We have the National Association of Manufacturers who tell us overwhelmingly the people who support that trade association, that are represented by that trade association, want reauthorization of the Export-Import Bank. We know that the unions that represent the workers who work in these industries have been asking us to do the right thing. And so here we are once again at the 11th hour. Last year we agreed to a short-term extension, six months, believing that we would not be in this spot today. Believing that we would not be at the last minute threatening the charter of the Export-Import Bank. So guess what? We have over six, over $15 billion of credit in the pipeline. Think about $16 billion worth of manufacturing exports in this country. And I want you to think not about the manufacturing exports, I want you to think about what that means. What that means for the American worker who work in those manufacturing facilities. They look at this and they say, you're, you're all about the economy. You all run saying we're all about jobs. We're all about improving the economy, of creating opportunity by getting American manufacturing back on its feet. But yet we can't do something that has been done for 70 years and frequently by unanimous consent in this body. So where's the opposition? The opposition is nothing more than ideology. The opposition comes from conservative think tanks who score this, who scare members here and say, if you agree on the, uh, to, to uh, reauthorize the Export-Import Bank, that'll be a black mark on your record. You won't be with us. You know what? It's time we're with the American workers. It's time we're with the small businesses. It's time we dispel the myths of this institution the Export-Import Bank, and start talking about this as a job-creating entity. You know, I have a chart here, and it's a, it's a theme that Senator Kirk and I are sounding. Senator Kirk and I have the bipartisan bill that we would like to see advanced in this body to reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. We've tried very hard to balance the concerns that people have for reform with, uh, with a, 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 a a reauthorization that gives some level of certainty to American manufacturers, to the institutions that finance them. And make no mistake, it's not that this is uh, public money. Simply what we're saying is that if a bank gives a loan 
to an American manufacturer, if a small town bank gives a loan to an American manufacturer, that will help guarantee that loan. It's like an SBA, it's like an SBA for manufacturing exports. We, what's next? We're gonna, we're gonna take on the SBA because they're doing too much good to help American businesses? And so I want you to think about this. 164,000 American jobs. That's direct American jobs. Not, not the secondary jobs that we know come from this primary sector development. And when you look at economics, you think about those jobs that, that are secondary and those jobs that are primary sector. Every manufacturing job that deals with export is a primary sector job. It's new wealth creation for our, for our state. And economically, that's manna from heaven. Because that new wealth that comes here in the form of payments for exports it circulates around our economy, allows our retail businesses to thrive, allows our, our restaurants and our secondary businesses, whether it's dry cleaners who support, whether it is you know, uh, people who are in the service industry to support those primary sector jobs. So 164,000 primary jobs. Exports of 27.5 billion. 27.5 billion, value of all U.S. exports supported by the XM Bank. And then when you look at it, guess what? People say, well, it must cost us something to do this. It must cost the American taxpayers something to uh, 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 fund the export bank if we're seeing these kinds of results. Guess what? Not only didn't cost us, it returned seven billion to the Treasury. Think about that. What's wrong with this? What's bad about this? Where, where is this failing the taxpayers of this country? Where is this failing the American worker? The simple answer is it's not. What's failing the American worker is this institution, the United States Congress, because we are failing to hand the tools to those businesses who can, in fact, create jobs, create economic wealth, and move our country forward. And it's not, I mean, people will say, oh my goodness, it's all those big companies. It's GE, it's Boeing, and that's really who we're talking for. Well, I want to I kind of look behind the curtain of that a little bit. Not just talk about the small businesses in my state that are going to benefit and the agricultural producers that benefit from this institution. Think about the literally thousands of small businesses that support Boeing the thousands of small businesses who support um, the folks at GE. Think about the businesses that actually are, are uh, the, the contractors with these large institutions that make parts, that make the, the, uh, uh, the sandwiches that feed the employees. This is primary sector growth. And we know that that adds to the benefit of the entire economy. So let's talk a little bit about why someone from North Dakota cares about the Export-Import Bank. And if you look at more than 58,000 small businesses around the country depending on the Export-Import Bank to finance the export deals, and they will all lose if we do nothing. There is 15.9 billion, as I said, in the pipeline. The Export Bank has supported $139 million in sales in North Dakota alone since 2007, and $102 million in exports from our state. Think about that. A little state of North Dakota, how significant this institution is. I want to tell the story of a small business. We heard just heart-wrenching stories. One from California, an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur who gave his all in Vietnam. 100% disabled. He has a small business, had a dream, living the American dream, serving his country. Guess what? He lost, because of the uncertainty here, he lost a $57 million contract, putting over 100 people out of work. And right now, he is challenged because he has a $200 million contract on the line, waiting for reauthorization of the export bank. Because guess what? The people he's selling to aren't going to wait. 
They're going to wait to find out if he's got financing. They're going to turn to the next manufacturer. You know who that next manufacturer is? That next manufacturer is China. You think that our, our competitors across the world, whether it's India and China, who aren't looking at reforming their export credit organization, guess what they're doing? They're pumping billions of dollars more. They're taking advantage of this. They're taking advantage of this opportunity. This is a sign in the Beijing airport, right? The Export-Import Bank of China. Want to be the best in a better world? They aren't hiding this. They aren't saying that's inappropriate. They're bragging about it. They're bragging where they think those businessmen are coming in and taking a look at where that financing opportunity is. And you might say, well, private sector can do it. That's not true. That is absolutely not true. We have had uh, uh, representations from almost every financial organization in, in this town saying we need the export bank to support our customers who need to have that credit for um, their exports. And so I want to close talking about a great business in Wapton, North Dakota, a town that I uh, grew up very close to. WCCO Belting in Wapton, North Dakota is a great example. It's a 60-year-old family-owned rubber stamp company which started out as a shoe repair business and diversified into repairing tarps for farm trucks and then into new seats for tractors, canvas belting, and wood slats. Today, the company provides rubber products used in farm equipment like belts for harvesting grain or producing round balers or tube conveyors to move seeds and grain, and that's, it supplies major farm equipment companies across the world. You know what? The simple fact is, and they will tell you if they were standing right here, that that company couldn't have done it without the Export-Import Bank 12 years ago, which allowed WCCO Belting to pursue export opportunities it had been ignoring. The bank has supported more than $830,000 in exports from WCCO since 2007. The Export Bank helps make sure that small businesses get paid for what they sell in a timely fashion not getting paid in a timely manner from foreign entities very quickly can put a small business out of work. The company now has 200 employees who generate more than 60% of their annual sales from revenues from customers who are located out of the United States, all possible because of the Export-Import Bank. Without the bank, they would be unable to compete in this global marketplace. It, it is, it, it, this is one of those stories in Washington, D.C. that makes the rest of the world believe that Washington doesn't get it, that the United States Congress doesn't get it, because they don't live in their world. They live in the real world, where you have to finance what you have, where those challenges get, get uh, harder and harder every day, and where you are competing in a market where people do this. 70 export credit agencies in the world, all competing for the same business, all helping their homegrown business compete for the same business that we're competing for. Unilateral disarmament. And so it was, it was not for any other purpose than the passion that we have for this institution that Senator Cantwell and I started talking about this during the TPA discussion started saying we need a path forward so the charter of the bank does not expire so that we actually reauthorize the bank before the end of this month. I would like to tell you that the prospects are great, that the overwhelming economic logic of the bank, the Export-Import Bank, has overcome all of the ideological uh, uh, discussion, I'd love to tell you that. I'd love to tell you that we're actually doing something in a timely fashion. We're doing something that makes common sense. Guess what? We're not. We're going to see the charter expire unless we every day come here and beg for a vote, unless we see movement in the House of Representatives so that the charter doesn't expire. I'm saying do not leave the small businesses of this country, the hope of this country behind. 
Um, let's, let's reauthorize the Export-Import Bank. Let's do it sooner rather than later. And let's actually respond to the concerns of the American manufacturing population.